Are you a small business owner looking to scale your business and your profits? Are you looking for strategies to find balance in your life as an entrepreneur? Stay tuned while Craig Staley, founder of HG Site Design, a website design and marketing agency, shares strategies from successful small business owners, authors, and experts on how to do just that. Let's join Craig as he explores how we can all take our businesses to the next level on the Small Business School Podcast. My guest today is Annie P. Ruggles, the founder of the Non-Sleazy Sales Academy. You're really going to like Annie. She has a great personality and really brought it today, which made up for me being sick and probably not sounding the best. She more than made up for it. We have a great conversation and and talk about how to best position your business. She gives a lot of actionable tips on how to overcome sales avoidance and maybe why it even happens to begin with. And then, you know, if you are listening in the Chicago land area and you are driving, you may want to pull over to the shoulder because she's got some hot takes on deep dish pizza. And I really don't want you to get in a car accident. So a lot of great advice for people who are in sales. And if you're in small business, you're in sales. So definitely a lot of advice that we all can use. So without further ado, Annie P. Ruggles. All right. I'd like to welcome my next guest. It's Annie P. Ruggles. She is the founder of the Non-Sleazy Sales Academy. How are you today, Annie? I am fabulous. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So give the listeners a little bit of your background before we get started here. So my background, as many of our backgrounds are, is pretty much like if you took spaghetti and chucked it at a ceiling and then let it fall down. Like that was about as direct my path to where I got here is. But it really does start in childhood. I'm the child of two entrepreneurs. I grew up completely obsessed with small businesses, largely mom and pops. And I just had this devotion and passion to keeping them alive that followed me throughout my life. I did not intend to be an entrepreneur. I Well, I did in a different way. I went to school for theater. So I wanted to be a teaching artist or an artist. And that was my expectation, which in its own way is entrepreneurship and small business ownership and that you're putting yourself out there every day. My mom was a speaker. I was like, I don't want to be a speaker. That's not my thing. I'm going to be an actor. We'll go this way. Well, guess what? Actors have to eat. And so one of the easiest jobs that I could find was as a receptionist for a company called Broadway in Chicago. And they inside hired and were like, let's put you in marketing because you're quirky and can do things. No training, no nothing, thrown to the wolves of marketing. But it turns out that I had some natural talent. So working with the bigs, I learned all the lessons of marketing. And then I started stealing them, air quotes, stealing them, but modifying them for small theaters, which got me back in front of other small businesses. So then I stopped focusing on theaters and I did marketing and branding for very small companies for about eight years. I stopped in the middle to do some weird stuff in software, which was serving small businesses in the startup scene, totally different way. But when that dissolved, the company was acquired. I decided to go back out on my own, again, doing marketing and branding. But this time, the real kicker was I realized that my clients weren't getting to where I thought they should get based on the work that I was watching them do and the work we were doing together. And my own business was not scaling at the rate that it should. And it turns out that the elephant in the room was that all of us were actively avoiding having to ask for the sale or we're doing things that were self-protective that would sabotage our selling. And I thought, this is what has to change. So in 2019, I pivoted to focus exclusively on selling. And I've been in this lane ever since. Interesting. And so you said you're from Chicago. You, did you grow up in Chicago? I did not. I grew up in Missouri. So, you know, one whole state over, but the farmier version of Chicago. For sure. Mm-hmm. So I noticed on your website that you don't like deep dish pizza. I do not. Okay. What what do you have against deep dish? Listen, I love dairy, Craig. I love dairy. I am a Midwestern farm chick. That being said, 
Deep dish pizza, Chicago deep dish pizza, for people that do not know, is about two inches of crust on the bottom and like the pie side, right? It's about two inches of super dense crust. And then no joke, no joke, there is at least two and a half solid inches of mozzarella cheese. And then on top of the two inches of solid mozzarella cheese, then you have your toppings, right? Your meat, your whatever else you put on your thing. And then they top the whole thing off with the chunkiest tomato sauce imaginable. (laughs) Pizza is normally a quantity consumption. You're like, yeah, I'm going to kick back, watch a game, have a couple pieces of pizza. So hang out, have a pizza party with my friends. After you eat one piece of deep dish pizza, you have to nap for at least a month just so your body can process <laughs> all the freaking lactose you just consumed. Like yeah. it's just, it sits in your stomach like a brick. That is true. But also, to be fair, I did say I grew up in the St. Louis area and St. Louis pizza is basically if you put pizza on a saltine and that's what I grew up on. So swinging way wide to the opposite extreme of the Great Wall of Dairy was just a whole lot. <laughs> Got it. So St. Louis, I did not know that they had a style of pizza. St. Louis is like the fancy Tostino's pizza, basically. Exactly. Cracker thin, crispy, square cut. Oh, gorgeous. Gorgeous. <laughs> but yeah, and then I moved here and everyone was like, you have to get deep dish. The first time I got deep dish, my dad took me to Gino's East. Hi, Dad. He listens to all of my interviews. Thanks, Dad. And uh, we didn't know. So we got a medium pizza. Yeah. An order of mozzarella sticks. To like enough start. for a family of eight. I, I don't, I don't, I think my calcium count is set for life. Like, I don't, <laughs> I don't think I'll ever get osteoporosis because I've had three pieces of deep dish pizza. Like, okay, that's all I need. Calcium all right. counted. You do have a point. The last time I was in Chicago, I think I got a a lunch special at Giordano's and it was a mini pizza and it might've been the only time where I shouldn't have finished the whole mini pizza. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. It's an undertaking. Listen, everyone should do it once, but when you come to Chicago and you reach out to me and we go out, you can have your deep dish. I will be across from the table about as far away from that jazz as I possibly can be. All right. Well, now that I've derailed your interview on on pizza here. Hey, listen, it's important (laughs) to be polarizing. And a lot of Chicagoans are going to be very angry at me right now. And they can just deal with it. But it makes sense that you're from Missouri. I thought you were from Chicago. So that that definitely makes sense. So you transitioned to a sales business. Mm -hmm. And you have, I think you come from a sales background, right? Your your grandfather-ish. Yes. Okay. So... Sales-ish. So I grew up in a household with my mom, my dad, and my maternal grandparents. My grandmother was a writer. My grandfather was a used car salesman. But take everything you think you know about used car salesmen and flip it. He was beloved. And he was not a man of many words. He was not a super emotional person. He was a German immigrant. He learned English after he moved to America Listed in the U.S. Army for World War II almost immediately. Like, this was not a touchy-feely dude. However, he did not have a manipulative, nasty bone in his body. And what he could do, because he was quiet, was he could listen. So when you put those two things together, he could listen and prescribe perfectly because there was never an agenda that came in that went, well, hold on. This is a mother, and the mother wants you know, a minivan for four kids. But you know what? The incentive this month is that we got to sell all the hot rods. So I'm going to sell this mother of four a hot rod. That would never even occur to him. So when he died, people came to his funeral that he sold cars to in the 60s. And he died in the late 90s. And people came and were like, he was amazing. Everything, every car we bought for 30 years, we bought through Fred, just like incredible. And so I grew up with those stories. And I also grew up with this indignation whenever anybody would badmouth used car salesmen, because the only used car salesman I knew was my grandpa, who was a literal stand up, greatest generation, decorated war hero dude, right? So I'm like, beat that. But then it really got serious in that my dad 
is a retired business strategist. He worked for McDonnell Douglas and Boeing for a really long time in their training department, and then went off on his own. And my mom is a decorated motivational speaker, also now retired. But I grew up as kind of the manual labor component of a small empire, right? My parents put me to work. Not that I didn't have a great childhood, not that I didn't get to play capture the flag or whatever like the other kids. But when there was, hey, it's family business time, it was sit down, read these contracts and input them in the computer. It was make sure that our website has whatever this new thing called SEO is, right? So I was raised in an environment where entrepreneurship was a possibility and where selling was not optional. Mm -hmm. And you were a part of it from an early age, it sounds like. Oh, yeah. My mom used to sell these big, amazing styrofoam hats that were shaped like crabs. Really long story on that one. But one of my favorite memories as a kid would be boxing up all of these giant crab hats to send out all around the world with my dad. We would play music, you know, we play Sinatra or something like that. We'd be doing all these things. And I still think about that in the way that I send things out into the world because I send all my clients care packages. And that's what it reminds me of is that joy of sending physical product out into the world, even though we weren't a physical product business. It's just one of those type things that I have such a strong belief in because I've seen literally over 40 years almost how impactful an ethics driven heart centered business can be. Awesome. So, you know, I I know you're a big believer in this and part of business and sales is positioning your business in the minds of potential customers. Mm -hmm. So as a small business owner, what do you think we can do better to position our businesses or strategize when we're trying to position our businesses? You know, there's two really big things that are really big problems with really easy fixes. The first is that we tend, like a love language, we tend to use the ones that most resonate with us. So we tend to sell how we like to be sold to. But there really are two types of buyers and about a gajillion shades of that in between. There are people that buy based on emotion and there are people that buy based on fact. But the majority of us lie somewhere in between. But if we tend to lean towards story, if we tend to lean towards shiny, then it's also our our proclivity to turn around and be like, I'm going to be a story-based seller. Woo, woo, woo. Screw detail. That's not my style. On the flip side, some people are like, I don't care at all about where this girl went grew up in her distaste for pizza. Just give me the sales tips already, lady. Those are detail buyers. If I sell really hardcore in one of those areas, I'm neglecting all of the other buyer types. So my first thing is make sure in each of your asks, you are addressing both fact-based buyers and emotional buyers in turn. And if it's two sentences, then that's fine. Split it right down the middle. Have a fact-based sentence and an emotion-based sentence right next to each other. That's fine. But you, in order to connect with a wide audience, you gotta have both. And when it comes to that emotion and when it comes to that fact, one of the biggest issues I see in small business is how people are taught to talk about pain points. Because the pain point is why we buy. Try to sell Tylenol without talking about headaches or body aches. You can't. Take this random concoction of weird, impossible to pronounce chemicals, Craig. Put this in your body. Put this in your kids. You'd be like, why? Why on earth? To make them feel better. To make them feel better from what? From that headache they have. Oh, I get it. It's a headache remedy, right? We are selling remedies. We cannot shy away from the pain. But what a lot of marketing and a lot of selling does is it makes the seller the hero. It makes the client the villain, right? And it makes the magical solution, the deus ex machina that comes in at the end and fixes everything. No, 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 no. That is why people don't like talking about pain because we don't want to go in there and be like, Craig, is your business failing because you're a mess? Are you making all the wrong decisions in your business? Get it together, Craig. Don't you want to be rich? Don't you want to be famous? Okay, why would a heart-centered person want to sell like that? We don't, but we think that we have to. Instead, what if we say, hey, Craig, is your business not where you think it should be? That sucks. You work really, really hard. 
and you should be seeing better results than this. What if we took all the tenacity you've already shown and put some sales skill behind it? What then, Craig? How can I partner with you to solve this problem? You are not the hero. They are the hero. The hero is in pain, though, and we got to talk about the dragon that they're up against or the story is too boring for them to buy. That makes a lot of sense. Make the customer the hero. The customer is the hero. Whatever they're up against, the problem, that's the villain. And we get to choose what kind of mentor, sage, advisor, teacher, support system, cheerleader, advocate we want to be in order to best serve that problem solution. Perfect. So one of the things I know you talk about is sales of avoidance. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think it takes a special person to really enjoy sales. But how do you know if you're stuck in some sort of sales avoidance pattern and And how do we overcome something like that? I'm going to argue with you on something. Okay. I don't think it takes a special kind of person to enjoy sales. I think it takes a special kind of person to enjoy the manipulative, nasty, arm twisting Mm. grossness that we have come to expect as sales. That makes sense. But the art of selling, to go back to my last point, is really just problem solving for money. I think anybody who puts themselves out there every single day would enjoy problem solving for money, which is really all selling is. But the great thing is sales avoidance is not really a response to here's the solution that I'm offering. Here is what it costs. Do you want this or not? That is not what we rebel against. We rebel against the ways that we have been negatively sold to, and we rebel against the times that we have tried tactics that hurt our ethics or integrity or drove the client away from us. That is what we actively avoid. Do you think we also avoid rejection? Of course. Of course we do. Who wants to be rejected? Nobody. But you know what we do is we get stuck in this trap of over-marketing so that we never get rejected. And we and what we do is we convince ourselves over time, and I am pro-marketing, hardcore, but the number one way to waste money is to market forever and never sell, right? Because we get into these habits of like, I don't want to ask, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to be the obvious choice for them. I'm going to load them up with content until they have to pick me. That's how that's going to happen. No, no. That's not how that's going to happen. That person is going to see you as a public library, as a font of beautiful information that they can access willingly at any time. And that's great. But you're not a nonprofit. A library has city funding. A nonprofit has grants. You are a business. If you sit there and wait for people to buy in unasked, you're going to be waiting a really long time and you're probably going to wait your way out of business. But what we avoid, yes, is rejection, but it's also the actions that we think we have to take to put ourselves up for rejection, which none of that is required. Not one bit of it. How you've been asked, how you've been pressured, how you've been lied to, how you've been manipulated, oversold, underdelivered, all of these things, none of that is required behavior, but asking is. So how do we get out of that cycle of of avoidance? I'm wondering if it's a simple answer. It is. Keep your eye on the problem that you solve and keep your eye on the why of why you're solving it in the first place. If you know, if you can promise yourself, if you're religious, you can pray on it. If you're not, you can swear on it or you could just howl at the moon. I don't care, but promise yourself that you will never, ever, ever sell anybody anything that they don't want or need because every sales that service or experience that you have had that's negative is when somebody did that. They sold you something that you did not want. They sold you something that they did not need or they sold you something that they convinced you that you wanted or needed that you didn't, right? Don't do that. Don't do that. If you promise yourself you won't do that, then you can show up in a selling situation to listen and prescribe. And the only question you have to ask yourself throughout the call is, am I right for that? Am I right for this? They need that. Am I right for that? Is that what I provide? Is this my lane? And at the end of the call, you may very well be the one that go, you know, we're not a fit. And they're not going to feel rejected. They're going to feel heard. They're going to feel seen. They might be disappointed. 
that you don't think that you're a fit. They may have been hopeful that you're a fit, but they're not going to walk away going, I can't believe Craig rejected me. Mm -hmm. (laughs) They're going, hey, that was a really nice guy. That way you can get referrals, even testimonials from people that don't wind up hiring you because you're showing up with integrity. So really it's that idea of what's the problem you solve? Why are you the right person to solve it for the right people? And how do we determine that beautiful win-win mutual fit? That's the key. If you focus on the fit, you will not manipulate the other person. Perfect. So I think we kind of answered this, but I still want to go a little bit deeper. So if, if we avoid selling because we don't think we like it, is it really just a mindset shift around the reasons why we think we don't like it. And, and I think what you're saying is it's the way we've been sold to in the past. It's, it's the kind of sleazy tactics that that make us not like selling. And, and if we just sell based on, you know, can I solve that problem for the customer? It's going to be a much more enjoyable experience for us. Is that the gist of it? That's the gist of it. But I call it sales baggage. And there's there's the main idea of sales baggage. The main feeder of sales baggage is the one that you just mentioned, which is how we've been sold to, right? But was there ever a time in your childhood when you had to sell something for your school? For sure. Yeah. And did you hate it? No, actually, I was I grew up on a farm. I think you said maybe you grew up in farm ish. Farm ish. Farm ish. So I, I was in FFA. I don't know if you know what there that is. There you go, future you, farmers of America. There we go. And we sold fruit. And all the other kids, you know, they would have their parents take them to their neighbor's house and say, hey, here's my sheet. I thought, you know, there's an easy way. I'm just going to start going through the phone book. And so I just would call. And, you know, of course, my parents hated it because I had a whole truckload of fruit to deliver at the end of the of the, <laughs> the season. But, yeah, I mean... You also tied up the phone line because yeah. back then you had to have what, like one phone line? And so in, in our it. town, yeah, you didn't have to do an area code. At one point, I think this was after that point, but at one point you could just dial four digits and get somebody in our town. Yep. But yeah, it, yep. it, 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 at boy, by that point it was seven digits. So. But see, you found a system. What I hear in that story yeah. is you created your own system as a kid. For me, what I remember is Innsbruck wrapping paper. We had to sell wrapping paper and you had to get a certain quota and there was a competition on top of it. And one of the things that's hilarious about me teaching sales is that I am arguably the least competitive person I know. Like I am the person that you play board games with that just has a great time, win or lose. Who cares, right? Now, as such, as a kid though, when they're like, you can win a pizza party for your class. I'm like, I don't care. I don't, I don't, that doesn't incentivize me. You can win a Barbie. Cool. I'd rather not sell and not have a Barbie. Like, okay. But I remember that door-to-door feeling. And a lot of us get started in door-to-door sales as a kid. Oh my God, sales trauma. You have to meet that number. You don't have any control over what you have. If somebody asks you a question about what's in the peanut brittle, you don't freaking know. You're eight years old. Right. So that stays with us. Another one is people going into small business from corporate environments. They are so used to having the whip cracked on their policies and the arm twisting, get the number, ring the bell, turn it over. Next person on the spreadsheet, quick turnover sales, get it, get it, get it and keep moving. That is a totally different environment than when you're a small business and you're selling something of yourself. The pressure is there, but you're also controlling things like delivery and customer service. And if there's a problem, you solve it proactively yourself or a close member of your team. It's not so far removed. But we remember that mentality of this person is not a person. This person is a transaction. After you pick up that call, Hang up the phone, pick it up, call the next person, get the no, whatever, hang up, click up the phone, call the next person. We have that entrenched of like, I guess I don't treat these people like people. I guess in order to make money, I have to treat these people like sales on a spreadsheet. Also untrue, right? But all of those things combined, how we've been forced to sell, how we've been taught to sell, the times in our lives when we had to sell and we had no clue what we were doing, that insecurity stays with us. And it all makes this big old casserole and nasty. 
right? So to your question, is this a mindset thing or a strategic thing? It's really both. The mindset thing is just understand that none of that baggage is required. None of it. But then having the mindset shift is not enough. What I want you to do is take the actual leap, look in detail at the sources of those baggage, and I want you to create action items and policies and strategies in your business that are not just the neutralization of that tactic. I want you to go to the opposite extreme. I want you to come up with action items that stake your claim as the opposite of the ways that you hate selling. Give me an example. Okay, here's one. When I was working in software, I would be despondent all the time because I would be in these meetings and I would watch well-intentioned people be asked, and you can deliver this on time? Yes, sure. Of course you can deliver this on time. And you can deliver this in budget? Yes, of course. Sure. Yes. Get the contract. Sign the thing. Yeah, we'll deliver it. And then I'm their point of contact in the room when I heard them say, yes, we will deliver this on time. Yes, we will deliver this in budget. And then I watched the customer service never tell them we're approaching 90% of budget or this is delayed until there was a problem. And then they would come to me and they would say to me, who had no control over the technology whatsoever, could not tell you how the internet works, does not care. The client who I deeply care about will come to me and go, Annie, where the hell's my app? I was told that this was going to be delivered on time and under budget. No. So when I, and that stunk, that absolutely stunk over and over and over and over and over, raised my cortisol, raised my blood pressure. And so when I went back out on my own, I made myself a promise. I said, no blown deadlines ever. And if I do blow a deadline because life happens, this is how I'm going to proactively tackle it when I tell the client that their deadline's being blown. And having that core principle has guided me entirely because I do not blow deadlines and I do not have the reputation as a deadline blower. And on the times where I wanted to go get my first vaccination shot. So I had to move something back a couple of hours. I went to the client and said, and said I'm so sorry, but it up. But instead of doing something like that, I'm sorry, please forgive me email. I said, listen, blowing this at the last minute. I hope that you will realize that this is out of character for me. Here's what I need to ask for. I'm asking for a day's grace. And in exchange, I'm going to give you a 90 minute call on me to show you that I really hate abusing your deadlines. People come back from that and they go, oh, you're getting your shot. How are you? Are you okay? Do you want until Friday? That's customer service proactivity based on something that I hated from selling. The other thing, how one of the biggest sleazy versus non-sleazy things is how objections are handled. I cannot handle it because I've listened to a lot of calls when people will break people down in objection handling or argue it right? Like I've seen your wife, your partner walk around in the background. If you were going to sell to me, or if I was going to sell to you and you said, I need to talk to my partner. What a lot of sales training would teach you is be like, Craig, you're the man of the house. What the hell? Why? It's your business. It's it. Just make the decision. You don't need the input. You don't, blah, blah, blah. and they do this even more to women playing into gender roles, assuming also that they're heteronormative relationships. You don't need to talk to your husband, girl. You're fine. I don't make any decisions without talking to my husband. And I'm the most independent person I know. You know why? I like a second opinion. It's not a permission thing. It's an opinion thing. But the majority of times, oh, it's a little expensive. It's more than I thought. No, it's not. Stop drinking all that fancy Starbucks. You could get this paid in no time. Don't you want this, Craig? No, no, no. I hated that. So what did I do? I boldly stood at the opposite. I said, every time I get an objection, the first things out of my mouth are going to be agreeing with the objection because it's true to them. If they say it's expensive, yes, it is an investment. Let's talk about how you can see return on that investment because obviously that's important to you. If you say, let me talk to my partner, I'm going to go, great. What are your partner's drivers? How can I help them convince that this is right for you if this is right for you? If they say the timing's not right, Annie, I need a little time. I go, okay, here's your homework and I will be following up with you in a month to see how your homework went. We'll connect again. And then I reach out to that person in a month and I say, as promised, I'm following up to see if now is a better time, but I have permission to do that. So that's what I mean by if something hurts your heart to do, 
it's not enough to just go, well, I guess I just won't talk about objections, really. I'll just let them do it, and I'll just, you know, let them on their merry way. No, no, no. That's not solving the problem. That's just negating a negative thing. How can you, whether it's deadlines, budgets, objections, customer service, delivery, arm twisting, fake gimmicks, whatever it is that drives you bonkers, how can you literally go through the Alice in Wonderland looking glass into something better? Because I guarantee you, if you start acting on those, your sales will follow almost instantaneously. Yeah, you're solving the problem for yourself of not making it a a sleazy interaction where you have to beat Mm -hmm. the customer down. And then all of us have been on a phone call or in front of someone who has to do the three no's and won't give up and you walk away angry and you'll never talk to that person again. So, So it doesn't really solve their problem of trying to get the sale either way. No, it just makes you cranky. Yeah. Right. Or, you know, I worked for a while for a brief period of time. And this is really where the non sleazy Sales Academy came from, was I was working as a coach under another woman and I really liked her. I thought she was just swell. But by the time I was the client facing layer, like the buffer between, and I got to the clients and all the clients were miserable in this program, miserable. And who, again, same thing as software. Who's the client coming to to, to cry? They're not going up to the top. They're coming to me. The one that was introduced as their advocate, their liaison, right? And I thought, why the heck are all these people so miserable? The program's not, you know, revolutionary, but it's good. It's solid. It has whatever. And I realized that the sales team, among other crimes, was telling them to take out credit cards, to take out predatory loans, to not tell their spouses if they didn't want their, if they didn't think their spouse would buy off. And so I would get into these things with these people and they would be calling me literally from a closet because they didn't want their husband to hear. And I'm like, this is a women's empowerment program. What on earth is empowering about crying in a closet because you spent 10 grand on something you can't tell your husband about and you bought into it under duress. That is why the non sleazy Sales Academy came about because I was watching these beautiful people not know how to sell and it was harming people. It was harming the buyer. And I just thought, listen, there are too many people out here that sacrifice of themselves and give and give and give and give every single day. And I am not going to let them fall down at the last possible second after they have practically martyred themselves with content and love. I'm not going to let them fall down in the form of sales avoidance where they just never make that final ask or by practicing a closer that is beneath their integrity. No. And I thought, how can I teach people to, te- I literally had the thought, how can I help people teach in a non-sleazy way? And that is how the non-sleazy sales academy was born. Let's transition a little bit. Let's let's talk about the business side of things. Mm-hmm. What would you say is the biggest challenge that you've faced in business and how did you overcome it? My boundaries were hot garbage. And what that resulted in was near constant burnout. Like if I wasn't fully burnt out, I was like setting off the fire alarms in my house. Like I was right there. And what I realized, sorry to interrupt you boundaries from the aspect of uh, allowing your customers to contact you at 2 AM on a Saturday type of boundaries. Uh Yeah. And a lot of it was sales avoidant boundary too. Right. So I love accessibility. I'm intentionally low ticket. I offer ridiculous payment plans and I'm proud to. It's the right choice for my business. But back in the day, I would act like a nonprofit, but I was not a nonprofit. So if someone came to me and they said, Annie, I got $5, I go, okay, well, normally I charge $200, but you seem like a nice person. Here's 90 minutes of my time for $5. Then that person would go out and say, I paid Annie $5 and she gave me 90 minutes of her time. So then they come to me and they go, okay, hey, how much block. is this? $200, $200. No, no, so-and-so said $5. Well, you're their friend. Okay, so for you, I'll do it for $5 too. And And it was just that idea of let me meet people where they are to the detriment of myself. Whereas what I should have done was found something at an accessible price point that would move the needle for them and get them going. What I should not have done was given them every Cadillac on the lot for the price of a smart car. 
I can't do that. And I did do that for years. And so on paper, my calendar was booked. My work days were full. My testimonials were pouring in. My clients were getting beautiful results. My bank account was overdrafted. My hair was falling out in clumps. I gained 100 pounds and I was a stress beast. Because I wasn't including myself in my own success. When I tightened up my boundaries, when I said, you know what, if you want tech support, text support, not tech support, because that's outside my boundary in a hardcore way. If you want to be able to text me, these are the hours you can text me. If you want to be able to ask a question, these are the appropriate avenues to ask a question. Or listen, I need to wait for you to ask for the group call. You know, but here's how I'm going to structure the group call. I had to incorporate myself in my own success because behaving like a nonprofit was not bringing me any profit. Yeah, that's advice I think a lot of us need to hear at times. What On the opposite side, what would you say is the best moment in your business history so far, if you could pick one? There isn't a far away winner, right? That's like, this was the epic moment. But there have been some big validating yeses, like you're on the right course, which I think as a small business owner is getting that sign that's like, hey, this is working. Keep doing it. You made a good choice. Like I treasure those moments. And for me, one of the most recent ones that that really stuck with me is when I launched my program, Sales for Empaths, as a program, I had been teaching sales one-on-one individually and I had taught it as a workshop but it was my first full scale, de- like content delivered, handed over, take it as you want it, show up whenever call. And I had no clue if this thing was going to work. I had faith that it would. I knew my content in was good. I didn't know if the mechanics would work. I didn't know anything. So I launched it and people bought it and I was thrilled. But then I gave it, you know, it actually launched and I turned the thing over and I was just despondent. I was just like, laying in bed, like fretting and freaking and da, 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 da. And I always send cowbells to my clients so they can celebrate their sales. And says, there's little cowbells, they're green. They say, I made a non-sleazy sale. And in a matter of days, I got a video from a client. Now, those days were excruciating, but I'm saying three or four days into this, I got a video from a client who I had not previously known and they were ringing their bell and they said, I watched the first three modules overnight. I couldn't stop watching it. I had a sales call and I nailed it. And they rang their bell. And that for me was a lightning rod from the universe saying, keep this up. This works. And they've been ringing their bells and sending me those messages ever since. And every single one just builds on that first joy. But I think that first validation, somebody who didn't know me came into the program, no handholding got into the material, it resonated, they used it, it worked. Because <sighs> then I could take that beautiful breath of just relief and pride and just let it all go. That's awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. Who do you consider a mentor? And what would you say is the most important lesson they've taught you? My mentor of my life, my own personal Dumbledore, was from back in my theater days, and he has since left us. But he was one of the founders of The Second City, which was the main original theater for SNL and big in the comedy world. His name is Sheldon Patinkin. And the way that I knew him was he was the dean of my theater program in college. And he and I had a very special friendship, but he was the kind of person that everybody had a very special friendship with him. Like we don't understand how he loved all of us so uniquely and completely simultaneously. Like how is one person so capable of that love? But I think the lesson that he showed me and you have littles around, so I'm going to bleep this and then people can try to figure out what the bleeps mean. (laughs) They can't hear. I have headphones on. Oh, good. Well, (laughs) Well, then guess what? I'm going to say it outright, and then you can believe it if you want to for your show. You ready? Okay, sounds good. The quote is, it's better to be an asshole than a chicken shit. And what he means by that is not mistreat people. What he means by that is not be an asshole. But what he means by that is make a choice. It is infinitely easier to pull something back than it is to elicit something. So take the stand, say the thing, take the risk, try the copy, submit for the speaking gig, put the post out there that you think is wild and crazy. You know, whatever it is, 
submit to the podcast, ask to be heard, but do that because if you sit there in timidity, timidity does not move mountains. I'm not talking about vanity. I'm not even talking about loudness, but do the damn thing because even if you make the wrong choice, you're moving forward. Whereas when you stay in timidity or what Sheldon would call chicken shittedness, it just keeps you small. And when you are that small, you cannot adequately serve. So that is my lesson from him. Wow. That's great advice. And for, for you to pull all of that wisdom out of that one saying is pretty impressive. And it's, it's definitely true. At his memorial service, they had buttons and it means a lot of different things to different people, but at his memorial service, they actually had a button maker and they made little buttons that said better an asshole than a chicken shit. And it's, you know, you wouldn't hear those words and be like, ah, the effect of Maya Angelou. But for me, especially because I don't want to be an asshole, why would I want to be an asshole? I'm the non-sleazy sales academy, yeah. what? But what I do want to do is show up. And that, for me, is really what the quote is about. Show up. Do it. If you want to do something, you have to make the jump. You have to take the stand. Otherwise, you're just faking Yeah, I mean, it. you can change it to better to be bold than to be timid. And, I mean, that explains yeah. it. Yeah. Better to take the risk than to sit on your butt. Yeah. So, before we get to the last question here, where can our listeners find out more about your business? So my website is a carnal, a carnal, a carnival of sales avoidant wonders. So if you are in active sales avoidance, what I want you to do is go to my website, AnniePRuggles.com. You can find my masterclass there. That's free. You can find this interview, my own podcast, content, content, content all day. But listen, if you're not in a learning place and you're in a freak out place and you just need somebody to fix it then do not go to my website. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. What I want you to do is I want you to go directly to one of these two platforms, either LinkedIn or Instagram. Why? Because both of them have a chat feature that we don't have to be connected for you to use. What I want you to do is not like me, not follow me. What I want you to do, if you're freaking out about sales and you have something coming up that you don't know how to tackle, I want you to message me and I want you to ask me because I can get you unstuck faster than you can stress out about how to fill out a form on my website. That's awesome. So last question I ask everybody, if you could hop into a time machine and go back to the year that you launched your business, what advice would you give your past self? I would not go back to the beginning of this iteration. I would not go back to the launch of the non cc Sales Academy, but I would go back to the beginning of my first consultancy, the Idea Doula, mm -hmm. which was focused on marketing and branding. And I would tell me then, selling is not the enemy. If you avoid it, you will burn yourself out. It's that simple. If you learn to love it by erasing all the parts of it that make you sick and finding better alternatives, and if you stay true to who you are, then you can sell beautifully. But I could have saved myself, and I would love to save myself, if the time machine came, literally years of doubt and burnout just by choosing to include myself in my own success. That's awesome. Annie, a lot of great tips. I love your personality. Really Thank appreciate you. you jumping on the small business school with us and enjoyed it immensely. I love small businesses and I love schools. So obviously I'm delighted <laughs> to be here. Thanks so much again for letting me squawk at your audience. Absolutely. Have a great day. You too. Thanks for listening to the Small Business School podcast. If you like what you heard, please share it and leave a review. It would mean the world to us. If you are a small business owner or looking to start a business, join the Small Business School Facebook group. It's a private community of people focused on helping each other take their businesses to the next level. To learn more about our guest today or to be a feature guest on the Small Business School, go to craigsdaily.com forward slash podcast for more info.